But we're really thankful that you're here. I think that it, it's, this as much as it's something for you, it's something for us to be able to share this because the Lord has really been touching our lives over the years as we've learned to hear his voice better. And so we just want to share that everywhere we can. So tonight we're, our topic is recognizing God's voice as spontaneous thoughts. Uh, our names are Michael and Norma Latinsky, and we are from Kingdom Partners. And this is How to Hear God's Voice, Session 4. Good. Now, I, just a second ago, was really thrilled to see everybody, or many people, raise their hands that you've been practicing hearing God's voice. And it's been two weeks, and so we hope you haven't, you know, it hasn't fallen off and you've forgotten too much. And so what we want to do first is, you remember the hand signals and the four keys? All right, so let's do it together. What's the first one? Quiet yourself down. You guys have to say it. Not only do it. Quiet yourself down. Focus your eyes on Jesus. Tune into spontaneity and journaling. One more time. Quiet yourself down. Tune, uh, focus your eyes on Jesus. Tune to spontaneity and journaling. So tonight, we're actually going to talk about spontaneity, which is one of the main four keys that we've been sharing all the time. Now, you probably all know the word rhema. You've probably heard that. That's a Greek word, and it means uh, to hear a spoken word. And when we hear God's voice, God's voice comes to us as spontaneous impressions, thoughts, words in our mind, maybe a scripture, sometimes a picture, but it comes spontaneously. And that's very different than our natural thoughts, the way we think. We're very analytical. We look at things, we observe them, and so I would say that the thoughts that come into our mind that are ours are often very analytical. But the thoughts that come from our heart, that is the thoughts from the spirit, those are the thoughts that are spontaneous. They kind of just light on your mind. You know, they're very gentle. Now, we're going to talk about meditation, biblical meditation, which I'm sure you've all heard of and probably practice. And what my biblical meditation is, is a combination of our analytical thoughts, our thoughts, our analysis, and spontaneity, spontaneous thoughts. And so Norm is going to start talking and try to give you a handle on spontaneity. Okay, you should all have the handouts. I want you to follow along with the handout notes, okay? They're pretty complete, and you won't have to take notes that way. So, okay, um, point B, spontaneous thoughts are the voice of the spirit world. And not all thoughts, though, in our minds originate from us. They can come from your flesh, your, your human mind. They can have a demonic origin, or they can come from the Holy Spirit. And so, I don't know about you, but I'd really have more thoughts, the, rather have more thoughts from the Holy Spirit than the other two options. So the Hebrew word for intercession is paga, which means to strike or light upon by chance or an accidental intersecting. Isn't that interesting? I never knew that that's what intercession means. But it's actually, when you're, when you're praying for somebody, have you noticed, this is particularly for those of you that are on the ministry team, usually somebody comes in, they tell you what it is they want prayer for, and you find that you may go off in a completely different direction, right? Because that's what the Holy Spirit is showing you. His spontaneous thoughts are what really needs to be prayed. And so that's why it's important to be able to tune into it, that uh, in, in ideas that, that strike or light upon your, your mind by chance, or you accidentally fall, you know, uh, intersect them. The Hebrew word for prophesy is nava, which means to bubble up like a spring of water. The river of the Holy Spirit is flowing within the believer's heart, and it's not forced. It just flows out. And Jesus said in John 7, 37 and 38, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So if you want to hear from God, you need to, one, be thirsty. You need to come to him. That's the focusing part, right? So it's really, the, these are the four steps. It's stillness, focusing on Jesus, or, you know, you don't have to necessarily do it when it, for a spon every spontaneous thought to come into your mind. Then you have, but you have to be tuned to flow. That's the drink part. And as Jesus said, he promised, then he who believes out of your heart will flow rivers of living water, otherwise known as God's thoughts. 
So in contrast, the word for prophecy is zid, which means to boil up or cook up. It's done by the human will or flesh. So if it's like you're trying to make it happen and crank it up, it's probably not God's thoughts. God's thoughts will just come kind of bubbling up very, very gently into your mind. And because we're joined with the Holy Spirit, we're actually grafted into the vine. And Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So if you think about it, branches don't have to work to produce fruit, do they? Because they're grafted into the vine, and the vine is the life source. And so it should be that way with us, too. If we're walking in the Spirit, the, the, these things should just naturally flow from us. We should be in tune with the Holy Spirit, hopefully as much as possible. Now, to hear God's voice, you need to move from what Mark Verkler calls analytical reasoning to um, spontaneous flow in your heart or spirit. And I'll give you a couple of examples from my own life that I imagine you can probably relate to. All right, we were driving here this evening, and somebody was driving really poorly in front of us. And so we both go, man, what a moron, you know? Why did that guy learn to drive? And then the thought came to me, that wasn't very nice. <laughs> okay, so that was not my thought. That was the Holy Spirit spontaneously correcting me. And I'll give you another thought, also equally embarrassing. Um, how many of you have ever seen, and we have a lot, you know, we live in Thousand Oaks, and there's certain corners and in, in, in places where homeless people hang out with their sign that they want money. And um, there's one shopping area in particular where we have a lot of those people tend to hang out. And almost every store in the shopping area has a sign out in front saying, help wanted. So I see one of these guys, and my first thought is, why don't you just get a job? There's plenty of them out there. Okay, that's clearly my flesh. And then I get a spontaneous thought saying, why don't you pray for that person to come to know me? So that would be an example of being intersected with a much more positive thought than my own. That would be a God thought for sure. So let's talk about, this is Roman numeral two, qualities of God's thoughts interjected into your heart. They're like your own thoughts, except that you sense that they're coming from your heart, not from your brain, not from your head. And like we mentioned, they're going to be spontaneous. You're not going to think about them very deeply. They're just going to like appear in your mind. The first time I ever heard God's voice, we had been saved for about, I don't know, a few weeks. And the gal that had led us to the Lord, she was always saying, God told me this and God told me that. And I was really jealous. I wanted God to speak to me too. And one day I was just in our bedroom and all of a sudden I get this thought and it was kind of like encased in a bubble. It was that clear. It was, it's time for you to go to church. And I had never been to church in my life. And I'm, you know, we're both from Jewish background. So that was clearly not my thought. But I knew that I knew that I knew that it was God's thought. And so we were obedient and hey, we've been going to church ever since. Anyway. Um, they often come as God speaking to you in the first person. Now, you'll notice this in your two-way journaling. Not only will the Lord speak to you by name, he'll say, Michael, my son, or Norma, my daughter, or Sue, my precious child, something like that. He tends to, to, to speak to us that way, but he'll also speak in the first person, I, I, I want you to know this. I want to tell you that, my thoughts about this situation. So it's a very personal and God's thoughts are often light, light and gentle, and they will be easily cut off by any exertion of self. Your own thoughts, your own judgments, your own will can easily cut them, cut them off. So that's why you have to just receive without judging, especially when you're journaling. You just let it, you just let it flow. Whatever the thoughts that are coming into your mind, you just write them down. And don't worry about the spelling or the grammar or is this God or is this me. That You, you deal with that later. Okay. And this, I think, is... Very important. They have an unusual content to them. They're going to be wiser, more loving, more motive-oriented than your own thoughts. Because God is, frankly, nicer than we are. He really is nice. You know, we always talk about how God is good. He really is good. He's really nice. He's really kind. He's really loving. And God's thoughts will cause a reaction within your being, such as a sense of excitement, conviction, could be faith, pleasure, awe, peace, you know, could be any number of different reactions. But when you embrace the thoughts, when you actually follow through with them, they will carry with them the strength to do what God is calling you to do. And also you feel really good about it. 
you know, like sometimes God will call it, cause us to change a habit that's an unproductive habit. For me personally, an unproductive habit was going to the internet first thing in the morning to check my email and read Facebook and other things like that. And he kept telling me, I want you to spend the first part of your day with me. And it was a bit of a struggle, I'll tell you that, because it was a bad habit I was in. But you know, when you do it, you just feel better. Your day goes better. Everything is better when you're being obedient to God. So sometimes he will give you convicting thoughts, but they're always going to come to you in a way that will not make you feel bad about yourself. They'll just be helpful. And he'll also give you the Holy Spirit power to do whatever it is he's causing, calling you to do. Um, in time, your spiritual senses will be trained, and you'll be more easily and frequently able to experience God speaking to you in this way. You won't have to think about it too much. You'll just recognize that was a God thought. I guess I better pay attention to that. People can have creative flashes of insight from the Lord or destructive flashes of thoughts from the enemy. Let me give you an example of a destructive thought. Um, it could be a pornographic image come into your mind, thoughts of violence, harm, vengeance, things like that. And when, many years ago, this is like the most extreme example I could think of for our own lives. It was so crazy. We were at a conference in San Diego many years ago, and we were in a fairly high-rise hotel with a balcony. And Mike stepped out onto the balcony, and he gets this thought in his mind, jump off. <laughs> we, we knew this was not God. It was just completely out of the blue. It was so ridiculous. But, you know, we need to recognize when, God, when the, the enemy is putting a thought in our mind. Um, I, I work with students with disabilities at Moore Park College, and, and many of them come in very traumatized uh, with a lot of uh, mental health problems. And some of them are, are you know, self-harming. They, they cut and they do stuff like that. And where do you think those thoughts come from? Those, they're coming from the enemy. But the, 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 these students don't recognize it. You know, they think, oh, this is my thought. And they'll, they may often act it out. And so that's bad. Those are destructive thoughts. We want to not pay attention to those. In fact, you want to rebuke the enemy when those kinds of thoughts come. And then, but in contrast, you can have these wonderful creative flashes from the Holy Spirit. Um, they, they're just, they just come to you spontaneously. One of our favorite ones is um, the story of the Miracle Man, or the, what was it, the John Deere Miracle Man. That was it. This is, uh, the John Deere tractors used to have a problem of not being able to stop once they started, and they would tend to run over people, which was not good. And so we knew this guy who worked for John Deere, and in the middle of the night, he wakes up, and, and God gave him the solution. And so he wrote it down, took, him, took it to the executives, and they go, wow, this is just what we've been looking for. So they implemented it, and, um, and it now, now John, John, Deere, John, Deere, excuse me, John Deere tractors, that's a tongue twister, um, uh, do not run over people anymore. So he's, that's why they call him the Miracle Man. Uh, and those of you that are musical, that write music, like Wes and uh, other people here, Laura, don't the, doesn't the music just kind of come to you spontaneously? You don't have to sit there and go, I got to make this happen. I got to make this happen. No, that's just like it'll just kind of flow to you. The lyrics and the melodies, those are spontaneous. Um, it's just spontaneous downloads, creative downloads. For those of us that are Bible teachers, you know how it just, I just kind of know how to organize my thoughts. They'll just, when I sit down, and they'll just kind of flow. You know what I'm talking about, Sue, right? You don't have to crank it up. It just flows. So let me give you some, um, some examples of spontaneity in our own lives. Um, when it, this one happens to everyone very commonly. You're reading the Bible, and suddenly you get to a verse that just really, there's just something behind it. You know, it just kind of, we say it jumps off the page, or it's highlighted, or whatever. And you just realize that's the Holy Spirit highlighting that for you. So it's something you need to tune into and ask the Lord, what is it you want to say to me here? Sometimes uh, we'll have just a person's name or face just pop into our mind, right? And what we need to do is say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And a lot of times, you just, it's just, I want you to pray for that person. And you may find out later on that at that same time, that person really needed prayer. Exactly. It was that one of those intersections where God, the Holy Spirit, was showing you something that you needed to intercede about. Um, have you ever had the experience of you're driving along on the freeway, and then you just get this random thought, change lanes, change lanes? Well, I've learned to 
pay attention to that because one time I was on the 101 just barreling along and I, the, I get this thought, change lanes. Ah, change lanes. Oh, okay. So I changed lanes and you know what? There was a pile up in the lane that I would have been in. I would have been right in the middle of that crash. So these kinds of spontaneous thoughts, we need to be able to pay attention to them and because they can be so significant. Um, one time, I was working in the children's ministry, and I, it was probably like the toddlers or the elementary school uh, kids, and I was the assistant, not the teacher, but one of the kids asked to explain the Trinity. Wow. You know, I mean, most adults, we can't even explain it too coherently, but the Lord gave me this cool, spontaneous idea. There was a, a, a little jar of Play-Doh in the room, and so I took a ball of Play-Doh out, and he had me, he just said, well, just, just break it into three different balls. And, okay, here's the Father, here's the Son, here's the Holy Spirit. And then we put them all back together into one and said, look at that. They're separate, but they're all the same. They're all the same content. They're all the same uh, material. And that kind of explained it to the kids. And I was kind of blown away because I'd never thought of that, about that before. Uh, and then the, the last story that I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you about Michael, was a research scientist at UCLA for many years. And, you know, in re doing research, you're always running into problems. And so he would just pray and ask the Lord, and God would give him solutions. True? Yeah. But, yes, it definitely helps. As, you know, it really helps everything that you do if you can tune into the Holy Spirit. My last example I'll give you is um, how the Lord can give you spontaneous thoughts for other people when you're least expecting it. One day, well, I'll back up. We have some friends uh, who are missionaries, uh, for long-time missionaries for Jews for Jesus, and they've been stationed in Europe, and they, what they, they move from country to country after establishing a, a, a headquarters. And uh, so I don't even think I knew that they were thinking about moving, but I'm, I'm putting clothes in the dryer, and all of a sudden I get this idea. Avi and Ruth need to live in, um, they need to move to Budapest. And so I emailed him. I said, where are you guys thinking about moving? Because I, I got this thought that you should be in Budapest. And he emails me right back and he goes, that is a confirmation. That's exactly what we've been thinking. So that was, that was pretty fun. So that's what, it's just, just really fun to be able to um, uh, tune into the spontaneous thoughts of God and, and, and see what he take, where he takes you. I mean, I know people that the Lord will, will actually tell them, I want you. Well, Lynn, you're a perfect example. Remember when the Lord told you to pack a lunch or pack some lunches and go to this park? And it was, it was, it's a too long of a story to tell you, but it was a beautiful encounter that he had planned for a woman who, had, who was out of food and she was expecting company. Wasn't that it? And she prayed that morning. She says, God, you need to send me food so I can have my guest. And so he spoke to Lynn, and she made lunch and then connected her with this person that she didn't even know. And it was, it was, it was really, really a lovely story. So fun things can happen when we're listening to the voice of God. Okay, I want you to, let, now let's look at, in your notes, there's Roman numeral three, Bible study and meditation. Now, you're going to be surprised to hear this, but the Bible does not advocate study in the way that we usually think of it, as a very intellectual, uh, analytical activity. God instead wants us to meditate on his word. In fact, we're told 18 times in the Bible that we're supposed to meditate on the scripture. And only once is the word study used. And here's the verse. Um, Ecclesiastes 12.12, 12, it says, Too much study causes weariness of the flesh. So that's not really a great endorsement of study, is it? In 1 Thessalonians 4.11, in the King James, Version, King James Version, it says, study to lead a quiet and peaceful life. Well, King James Version was written a long time ago. We have a much better understanding of Hebrew now. If you read the New King James Version, it says, aspire to lead a quiet and peaceful life. Very different than study. Similarly, in 2 Timothy 2.15, the old King James, King James Version says, study to present yourself approved. But the more modern translation says it means be diligent to present yourself approved. So we don't really need to study the Bible. That isn't the goal. Don't get me wrong. I study the Bible. I love to study the Bible. Okay, it's good. But knowing the facts isn't the goal. Knowing the author is the goal, right? And that's how, and it's Bible meditation, spending time with the Lord is what's going to get you there. 
Um, so reading and um, meditation on the word releases revelation while study brings information. And we want God to speak to us through the word. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And this is two-way journaling is really fun for this. And we're actually going to do a, um, an exercise in just a few minutes. And so for me personally, when I have my quiet time, my devotional time with the Lord, my, my jumping off point is always the word. It just helps me to get grounded, to get focused on the Lord. I don't just necessarily sit down and say, Lord, what do you want to say to me today? And then journal it out. I usually, I usually read, the, read the word first. So, I, you know, that would be my recommendation. Because we do want to be people of the word. We need to know the word. But we need to not just know the facts. We need to have the teacher, the counselor, be taking those words and bringing life to them spontaneously. Yeah, today when I was spending time with the Lord, I was reading about walking in the Spirit and uh, not really thinking much about that. And then I went to a time of journaling, and guess what my journaling is on? How to walk in the Spirit. And I had actually a couple pages of him talking particularly to me about how I'm supposed to walk in the Spirit. So that's an example of how you, know, you can get something from the Word and the Lord can expand it. Uh, we're going to actually, I'm going to read to you a section, perhaps some journaling from one of Mark Verkler's students. This is from an assignment that he gave, because it says in Joshua 1 8, meditate on the word day and night. That means really spend time meditating on the word. So this is from, the assignment was to read Galatians 3.27, which says, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That's a great verse. But what does it mean for you personally? And so what Mark Berkler did is he challenged the students to ask the Lord, what do you want to say to me about Galatians 3.27? Now you have this, but I'm going to read it. And I want you kind of just to let these words sink in because this is actually, this was personal prophecy to the writer, the person who was journaling it, but this is something I think all of us can pay attention to. And so this is what the student wrote. Each follower of me looks like me. You have your individual personalities and physical characteristics. But in the spirit, you look like me. What do I look like? Gentle, patient, kind, considerate, loving, not self-seeking. You've been baptized by water and the spirit. You all look the same to me. Clean, washed, forgiven, and beautiful. I don't see your flaws. I see your potential. I always have hope for you. I never give up on you. I never fail you. You have purposely chosen me, chosen to put on my characteristics. You've been washed, clean from your old ways, and put on a new garment of praise, a new garment of goodness. That's how I see you with clean garments, always clean. How do I act? With love and understanding. I will stop what I'm doing for you. I will take the time to listen to you, to heal you, and pray for you. I am never too busy for you. I give you my garment, my clean, whitewashed garment. I give you myself, everything I have to offer. I give you my goodness, my love, my faithfulness. I invite you to put on everything I have to give you, every good thing. You have this right as my child, my follower, to put this on. You make a conscious choice to clothe yourself with my attributes. You readily take what I have to give you. With joy, you see the blessing in this. Rejoice, my child. Delight in wearing my garment like a child delights to dress up. Each day, put on this garment, my garment. Wear it like it is your own, because it is. It is mine, but you own it. I give it to you. Like Jacob gave his favorite son Joseph a beautiful garment because he loved him, I give this to you. You are my favorite child. All of you are my favorite child. 
There is no favoritism with me. One is not better than the other or more important. You are all important to me, all valuable to me, all worth saving. Now that's a journal entry of God to speaking his love. Do you feel his love? That came from one verse to sitting and meditating on that verse and letting the Lord speak to you. And that's what we want to do. We want to learn how to do that so that we can confidently meditate on the scripture and the Lord will speak to us. So guess what? We get to try it now. You'll see in the last page, I think it's on the back of your notes, is Psalm 139. And what we're going to have you do is take the next few minutes. You have 15 minutes to do this. And so there's no rush. And we're going to want you to read through this and meditate as you read. So the first thing, when you start to read, you want to do, what are the four keys? You want to quiet yourself down. You want to focus on Jesus. Imagine Jesus might even be sitting right there with you, might be sitting across from you, but focus on him. Then tune to spontaneous flow. Tune and pay attention to those spontaneous thoughts that come into your mind. And then you're going to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And here's the question that you can ask him. Lord, what are you saying to me through this scripture? So the way you read this is you just start reading it slowly and you read until you feel the Holy Spirit may stop you. And if he stops you, then you kind of sit there and meditate on that verse or that next two passages or whatever. But he, you'll, you'll get this sense as you're reading that he wants you to dwell here and you meditate there and then you just write what he speaks to you. Okay, so it would be spontaneous thoughts. So you're asking him, what are you saying to me through this scripture, which is where he's told you by the Holy Spirit to stop and dwell. All right, so we got give you 15 minutes or so to read through it slowly, keeping your eyes focused on Jesus and tuning to those spontaneous thoughts and then write without judging. Remember, childlike faith. Just write what comes into your mind. All right. Have fun. All right. So how many of you felt that you were hearing something from the Lord about what you were reading? Just raise your hand. Raise it high so people can see. Look at that. That is so exciting. That is really good. You don't know how wonderful that is. If you're teaching and you get a good response from the, from the classroom, you are thrilled. You just made our day. <laughs> And now, now, let's do it again during the week. Practice, okay? You want to do that. Now, does, anybody, uh, is anybody willing to share what the Lord gave them? Yeah, can you go back? Sure. Maybe we'll give you a microphone. It's always good to hear how the Lord speaks to each of, each of us. Um. I picked, I don't know what verse it is, actually. Yeah. Um, you may be frustrated about how wonderfully complex I've made you, but I want you to thank me because I've done this for a good reason. In fact, many good reasons, some of which you know and some not. I'm testing your heart now, and I know your anxiousness, and I have it all figured out. In fact, it's written down. <laughs> Think that was from the Lord? I do. That, was that, did that personally touch you too? In, in your heart, you knew that was the Lord speaking to you? I didn't know what I was going to write until I started writing. That's the whole idea. This <laughs> spontaneous writing of what the Lord was showing you. Wonderful. That's great. Anybody else? We're going to have to call on you if you don't respond, you know. it's <laughs> Norma's really good at this. <laughs> Over here. Oh, got it. I almost fell asleep listening to the Lord. <laughs> that can happen too. Anyway, um, 
And so what he told me was, I am with you wherever you wherever you go. Invite me in all your situations. Thank you for talking to me about your recent situations and issues. Let's see. As you can see, have already have a solution. And better days are ahead. I will use you as my mouthpiece. You are my beloved and have surrendered your heart to me. I love showing you surprises and taking care of your needs. Where you are, I am. Then I, there I am also, always enjoying our time. No matter what we do, I want to show you more revelations to come. That sounds like the Lord, what, don't you think? You notice how personal that was? You wouldn't have made that up yourself. You could not have done that. And that's one of the ways you can tell it's the Lord, is it's just so much nicer than we are, so much more loving, caring when you write. That's because he's loving and caring, and he just wants us to learn how to hear, that, hear him say that to us. Anybody else? Anybody else? Any courageous soul? <laughs> Sylvia, how about you? You want to try? Too personal. Very okay. private. That's okay. Yeah, that's I mean, sometimes okay. this stuff is so Much private. Okay. okay. Virginia. Virginia, I don't need to prove to you that I love you. You know that I do. I love you very much. I will always go before you in all your circumstances. I know that you feel that you've made mistakes, but know and keep in mind that you are learning how to walk with me. I will forever watch over you, deliver you, protect you, answer you when you call to me, and bless you. Keep doing what you're doing. You are never out of my sight. I love fighting your battles and showing up strong in your behalf. Love your faithful father. Oh, that was beautiful. Sounded like the Lord. Definitely. Yeah. Now, so we gave you one question you could ask about. You could say, Lord, what are you saying to me through this scripture? But you could also ask things like, what blessing or correction do you have for me, for me from this section of scripture? That's the one question. Or you could ask, Lord, what do you want to show me from this scripture? So it's really open. The whole idea is you and the Lord in a partnership of understanding his word. And as you meditate on it, he'll give you depths, new depths of understanding of who he is and who you are and how he sees you and how he wants to apply that particular verse or section to your life.